Top of the morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you guys for uh, calling in today and for uh, participating both the ones that we're gonna uh, talk to and also the participants that have uh, logged on for today's uh, webinar. I'm just briefly gonna do some um, some basic introduction in uh, Norwegian and then uh, the rest of these webinar will be in English. So, so to uh, those of you who are English speaking, uh, see if you can understand uh, understand the Norwegian. <laughs> I wish you luck. Anyways, uh, som sagt, hjertelig velkommen til dette webinaret som skal da handle om uh, idrett og ernæring og studier innenfor det som man kan ta internasjonalt. Vi skal først se litt grann på hva sonor er og hva vi kan gjøre for deg som studiesøker. Og så skal vi også se litt grann nærmere på studietilbudene innenfor idrett og ernæring, og da spesifikt ved University of St. Thomas og University of Birmingham. Men uh, de tingene som uh, de tar opp vil også være da ting som er relevant for andre universitet som man også ser på. Og helt til slutt så skal vi se litt på karrieremuligheter, og så blir det mulighet for oss å stille noen spørsmål helt til slutt. Hvis det er noen av dere som har noen spørsmål underveis, så bare skriv til mig i chatten, og så kan vi ta, samle opp alle spørsmålene til slutt. Men som sagt så vil mesteparten av dette opplegget foregå på engelsk. So, uh, first of all, we're going to do a brief introduction about study as a Norway and what we can do for you as a student. And then we're going to move onwards to talk a little bit about, uh, more about the reason why probably all of you are here. You're going to learn more about uh, the possibility to study uh, nutrition, dietics, uh, sports science and, uh, and coaching in an international environment. Uh, but before we move on to the main course of uh, today's webinar, I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about Tinder. Because uh, study outside Norway is kind of like Tinder, but rather than matching people romantically, we match people academically. Uh, and we also are sort of like a labor union in the way that we uh, make sure that the rights that you have as an international student uh, are not violated. We make sure that you have uh, good scholarship possibilities, both at the universities that we work with individually, but also that you get the uh, best possible support from the Norwegian government through uh, the political work we do as well. So um, I would say probably two things that don't get compared that much, Tinder and uh, labor unions, but uh, study outside Norway is uh, kind of the best of uh, these two worlds. So what can we in study at Norway help you out with? So we can help you out with mapping the alternatives you have based on your academic achievements and also your extracurricular achievements and the wishes that you have for your education. And we have a very, very good overview over the different universities, what they are good at, uh, and we can help you find a great fit for you. So we, uh, we take some time to get to know every single person that we get in touch with so we can offer the best possible uh, guidance and counseling through this uh, uh, for most people a rather overwhelming decision. We also help you up with the applications. We answer questions related to Lånekassen, which is the funding uh, uh, part, uh, visas if you need that, language tests, study preparation, enrollment and registration for classes if you need help with that. And also we make sure that you're able to get in touch with other students who are traveling to the same university. So you don't have, uh, so, so you actually know someone before you arrive on campus. So that's uh, one of the many benefits that you get for, uh, from applying through Study at San Norway. And all the help and guidance that we offer is free of charge for you as a student. So you don't pay us anything. So we have about 60 different universities uh, spread across across these countries, but uh, today we're mainly going to talk about uh, the US and uh, the study options in um, the UK. Uh, and we have with us uh, representatives from uh, University of Birmingham and also from University of St. Thomas in uh, uh, Minnesota. So uh, yeah. Uh, this should be really great. We also have some medicine and dentistry studies in Central, in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe. Uh, 
Um, this is just a brief overview of the current COVID situation. I thought uh, I would just quickly mention that as well. Um, as of now, there are a handful of universities in the US that are able to issue the documents that you need to get your visa in order to travel to the US. Uh, but for, I would say for the most part, uh, this January uh, or start this spring, uh, some universities have online starts and some universities have uh, a combination of online and campus-based uh, education. To Australia, it is the, the border is closed for everyone. So the only option, if you're not already in Australia, is to start online and then you can travel once the border opens up. It is kind of the same situation in the UK. Uh, I mean, you can actually travel to the UK and you can stay uh, in quarantine. So the border is not physically closed, but you have to stay in quarantine uh, for two weeks, if I'm not mistaken. In Singapore, it's the same situation. You can travel, but you have to stay for um, 14 days in quarantine before you uh, uh, yeah, can socialize with your new classmates. And also New Zealand is the same story as in Australia. Uh, it is uh, difficult to get across the border. So it is an online start for um, at least this semester. But it looks like there are um, some vaccines coming, uh, which should uh, hopefully uh, make uh, starting in f fall 2021 a bit more normal than it was this year. So that's, uh, I think yeah, everyone is excited for that, at least I am. So uh, yeah, um, I'm just gonna touch a little bit upon uh, why you should consider to study outside Norway, because I mean, we have some good universities in Norway, but there are some really, really good uh, advantages you, you get when you actually get the degree from uh, a university that is not based in Norway. So there was a big, big survey that was uh, compiled uh, in 2019 that looked at students who had done a full degree abroad and students that had done a full degree in Norway. And they found that if you have an international degree, you actually get a job much faster than students who have studied in Norway, which translates probably into you being more desirable for employers because you have this international experience. Uh, there is also uh, research that shows that you feel more mastery in work situations, so you feel more confident in, uh, in, in the situation that you, you work, uh, meet in your professional life. There is a higher number of students that are in leadership position after five and 10 years uh, of their careers. There's a higher start, starting salary on average. Uh, there are more options, of course. Uh, uh, in Norway, you can, uh, there are 27 institutions for higher education, but only through study outside Norway, you are able to apply for over 60 different universities. So there is literally a world of opportunities outside the, the Norwegian borders. Um, on average, students who study internationally are more satisfied with their studies. They have probably not surprisingly more international careers. They have better language skills on average. And another really good thing is the support that you get from Lånekassa. It is one, one of the best finance, uh, financing uh, solutions in the world for students. Uh, but personally, the thing that uh, I got out of studying abroad uh, was the experience and the friends that I got from, uh, I, I spent four years in the UK. Uh, and even though I studied uh, in uh, Wales and Scotland, I did not only meet Welsh people or Scottish people, I also became a part of an international uh, environment and I have uh, friends from all over the world. And I think the best way I can exemplify this is uh, with this picture. So this is actually from my wedding party two years ago. And uh, the girl in the white dress, that's my wife. And uh, these are the uh, nationalities that were represented in our wedding, uh, which uh, would probably not been possible if we haven't, hadn't both studied uh, abroad. So that's one of the really, really cool things that you get from studying abroad. You get the first class education, of course, but you also uh, get friends from all over the world. And just briefly before we, before I'll pass the word on to uh, uh, 
Uh, Adam and Ethan at the University of St. Thomas, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the support that you get from Lånekassen. Uh, so these are the figures, the total amount that you'll get uh, paid every year that you study. And also you can see the details of what is a loan and what is a scholarship from the Norwegian government. Uh, and if you have more, uh, more questions about the uh, student, uh, student support that you get from Lånekassen, just ask your sonar counselor or uh, ask me after this webinar. There is also good resources on our website about this if you're curious about how you're going to finance your studies. Uh, but the main uh, point I want to make is that uh, not all universities in the world are approved for support by Lånekassen, but all the universities that study outside Norway work with are approved. Uh, so if you get that admitted through us, you don't have to worry about not getting the support from Lånekassen. So uh, that was my... Um, 10 minute introduction. Uh, and I'm not sure if uh, Adam or Ethan is taking the, the lead on this, but uh, first of all, thank you guys for calling in and uh, I think I'll pass the word over to you guys. Wonderful, thank you, Thomas. Uh, Thomas, can I have a chance maybe share my screen here? Yes, of course, I'll stop sharing mine. Yeah, and I'll just take over here. Yeah. Okay. Thomas, can you confirm you can see this? Thumbs up. Awesome. Well, Thomas, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I kind of want to spend around 20 minutes kind of showcasing a little bit about our university here and uh, at the University of St. Thomas, which is located um, in uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis, Minnesota in the uh, USA. We actually have two campuses in uh, two different cities, but they're only separated uh, by about three miles, three, four miles. So the nickname for where we are right here is actually the Twin Cities because we actually have two major metropolitan cities very uh, close to each other. Uh, so again, thank you very much. And um, I wanna briefly just introduce, introduce myself, my background, uh, take maybe about 10 minutes talking about uh, kind of what we do in, within our department, who we are, our research capabilities, what we offer. And then uh, about five, six more minutes. Uh, actually, I'm got, I have a larger camera. I'm actually in our lab. I'm gonna uh, zoom this out and, and kind of showcase the space that we have and uh, the opportunities that we can provide students. And um, uh, following that, just open it up for any questions anyone might have. So uh, again, uh, Adam Korak, I'm in my fourth year, uh, assistant professor here, uh, tenure track line, uh, hoping, hoping to go up early uh, in another year or two. And um, I have a PhD in exercise science, but specifically uh, I specialize in biomechanics and uh, human movement analysis from a physics perspective and uh, strength and conditioning. Uh, I am a strength and conditioning specialist. Uh, so I have a little background working in training and, and programming, working with uh, high school and collegiate athletes. And uh, my primary research lines are um, causes of human movement, specifically kinetics, kinematics, and how our muscles activate and move, whether it's for performance benefit. Uh, so my early research line dealt a lot with different sort of lower body movement mechanics to maximize kind of strength improvements. And, uh, but the, the longer I've been out of my doctoral program, I've, I've actually uh, transitioned a little bit to viewing the same things, but looking at it more for elderly individuals. Uh, research is pretty clear. If you fall as an older age and, and uh, you kind of, and you, and you, have, you uh, have a hip injury, a hip replacement, um, age expectancy starts to really reduce. So trying to figure out a way to get these older adults into strength training programs to help them live longer and more quality lives. Okay, so University of St. Thomas, uh, our primary camp campus is located in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, the Twin Cities area has about 3 million people in it. So we are a big city. We're not like uh, New York or LA, Los Angeles, um, Chicago. Uh, so we're a big city, but we're not, you know, kind of massive. But what makes this interesting is we're a private liberal arts university. So we're a smaller school, we're a smaller private school of roughly 10,000 students in a major metropolitan area. So you kind of get a close community of, uh, we call them Tommies, St. Thomas, the Tommies. Um, Tommy students, you know, that can build a, that small liberal arts community but again, have all of the things that a bigger city has to offer um, 
when you're not full time being a, a student want to maybe enjoy a little bit of social life as well. Uh, that 10,000 students um, that I talked about 6,000 are undergrad and roughly 3,500 and above are, are graduate students. Um, 150 plus majors around campus and we have uh, students from 71 countries across the country represented here. So our department, this uh, couple images here, the gentleman on the top left is a colleague of mine, Dr. Brett Bruinix, um, and I'm on the bottom right there. And the uh, top right and bottom left images you see is a research project him and I have been working on. They actually have uh, internal funding to do. Uh, for example, we've been working with uh, over 50 adults ranging from 55 to 90 years old, and we've been doing pre-post testing on them. You can actually see the pre-post test happening on the top right and the bottom left and um, doing different land-based interventions and water-based interventions and seeing which one is having these adults and proven strength, speed, confidence, balance, so on, power development, so on and so forth after this uh, eight weeks of training. And what I wanna really key you in here on the top right and the bottom left, the younger gentleman on the top right of your screen, that's Carter Schmitz. Uh, he's a student, graduated a year and a half ago. He uh, was uh, a double major in accounting and then exercise science in our department. He worked as an accountant for a year and said, you know, I don't really want to do this anymore. So now he's uh, full into uh, uh, strength and conditioning with high school and collegiate athletes right now. And if you look at the image on the bottom left, the young lady on the right, uh, she is uh, also a student as what I'm trying to sell here is like we get our students involved in these research that, that we're doing with the faculty. And, and uh, that young lady, Mary Grace, she's uh, in her uh, second year in uh, physical therapy school at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which is a top 10 uh, physical therapy school in the United States. Um, so we, we, we really strongly believe in getting our students involved in research and helping us out and then getting them in their own research line. And ironically, research shows that students doing research improves learning outcomes. So we really believe that here at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, continuing on here, we have about 200 undergrads within our department. Primarily, they are exercise science uh, students. Uh, I'll break down the demographics here in a little bit. But um, we have really small class sizes here. I've never taught a class larger than 24 students, and our labs are capped at 12. Currently, with the COVID pandemic, we've dropped that down even farther to six. So I've actually condensed our labs um, into six students. Now, to put that into perspective, um, I went to a big state school. I went to the University of Alabama for my undergraduate uh, degree, and I um, took an anatomy class as part of my major, and I had 450 students in, in the class. It was in a gigantic auditorium. So I'll say that again. I had class with 450 students. And um, our labs, we had like 20 lab sections with 20 people in them, right? And the uh, majority of the classes that I was taking these general sciences were being taught by graduate assistants because the professor's primary job was to conduct research. Well, at our university, we are a teaching based university. You know, I'm expected to research. I'm expected to serve on committees and, and do service, but I have to be very good at teaching or I wouldn't be able to uh, be fortunate enough to work here. So what I'm trying to sell here with these classes is we not only are our professors very strong, strong teachers and effective teachers, you're getting specialized attention due to that small class sizes and specifically even more so in labs. We have eight uh, full-time faculty members in our department. I'm one of eight, four of them specialize in the exercise science area, two of them specialize in public health. We have one uh, nutrition expert, which I know nutrition was on the topic of conversation today. And we have one as well that uh, does undergraduate and graduate physical education, certified, uh, a certified teacher. And by the way, if anybody has questions at any time, feel free to interrupt. I won't take offense at all. So majors that we offer, major and minors, we have three majors we, we offer. Like I said, we have about 200 undergraduates with primarily them being ABS and exercise science. But as I said, we do have two uh, public health experts. We do have a major and a minor in public health. I should backtrack one second. We have a minor in exercise science as well, as you can see. So. A BS and a minor in exercise science, a BS and a minor in public health, and then we also offer a, a bachelor of science in health promotion and wellness. But again, the primary draw is coming from the BS in exercise science. So because I, I'm speaking from the exercise science part of our, our area, these are courses that um, our students take. If you see the first number, that's generally think of a one, two, three, or four. Think of that in the year that they would take this class. So if you see uh, the EXSC standing for exercise science, 130 foundations, generally think of that as them taking it their first year. 
um, versus all the way down at the bottom, you see the 449 research methods course. That's certainly what they would be taking uh, their senior year. What I really like about our program is we take the basic courses that everyone in our field should take. Basic human anatomy, basic human physiology, structural kinesiology, how we move from an anatomical perspective, um, and exercise physiology. If you look at any exercise science curriculum in the country, uh, they're going to have those four fundamental courses in there. Human phys, ex phys, um, anatomy, uh, kinesiology in there. But what makes us a little different, and I think in a positive way, is if you start to look at these 400 levels, we start to get into very specialized measurement and evaluation courses, uh, specifically this testing and prescription course, the 413, really gets them ready to measure and evaluate people. And if you look at 414, uh, this is the NSCA National Credit CSCS certification course, uh, really preparing people to work with athletes um, and design training programs. And uh, as I'll show in a little bit, our primary interest of students is getting into physical and occupational therapy programs. That's our primary draw, I would say. And these 400 level courses, including what I specialize in biomechanics with the labs, these 400 level courses are really starting to prepare them to not only be successful in graduate school, but then take what they've learned and, and, and apply that into their careers. And these 413 and 414, these are new courses that have been developed since I've gotten here over the past two years. Uh, so we have revised our curriculum and um, adapt and overcome. If you are not always trying to improve your curriculum, you know, to me, you're stagnant and someone else is gonna jump ahead of you. So um, yeah, and then lastly, a research methods course. Now I talked earlier that um, we, we highly get, we were highly recommend these students get involved in research early. While they are assigned to take a research course their senior year, this research class is very, hey, we've been prepping you to do this for three years now. You have the skill set, you understand the equipment, you know how to use the equipment, which I'll show you in a little bit. And then we kind of cut them loose and, and let them conduct their own research project. All right, so the equipment we have to offer here, we're very fortunate. Uh, to have some pretty pretty amazing research equipment here. I uh, broke it down into three different categories, uh, the biomechanics aspects, the physiology aspects, and um, uh, the musculoskeleton. Um, if you note the bottom right image, this is gonna be from our biomechanics lab. Uh, we have a motion capture analysis. A uh, few folks that maybe enjoy uh, Lord of the Rings and looking and seeing how Gollum was created, the character Gollum, if not, um, any modern day video game, how, are, how is Call of Duty and how is FIFA so realistic? Well, they use marker systems on these athletes and these individuals and they have cameras that can pick up and quantify human movement. Um, we have that ability. We also have Bertek force plates built into our floor here. Um, Newton's third law of reaction, if you remember from high school or college uh, physics class, we have the ability to quantify uh, how much force is being put down on the floor in the X, Y, and Z directions here. Uh, delta selection myography devices, again, allow us to measure the muscle activation across different movement patterns. And we have a biodex machine, which allows us to measure joint torques. From the physiology perspective, um, polar heart rate system, which Again, I am more on the biomechanics side, but I find this polar heart rate station pretty amazing. I know in Europe and Australia, this has been big for 20 years in soccer or football, as, as I believe they call it in Europe and Australia, um, which has been, I see Thomas like, like yep. Um, yeah, so they've been using these polar cyst heart rate systems for, you know, 15, 20 years, uh, tracking you know, these collegiate professional athletes and it has GPS in it, acceleration changes in it, and you can basically quantify how hard they're working if maybe they need to tone it back a little bit for injury risk. And uh, the U.S. Is, was a little late to the game here, but um, for example, um, the university I attended uh, from undergrad, you know, uh, 10 years ago did not have this and now they do. So in the uh, American U.S. football teams everywhere now use this. And uh, we have the ability to use it. And we actually work with our um, university uh, sports teams here, specifically soccer and volleyball teams have been interested in using this. And we'll talk about partnering with athletics that we do here. Uh, two metabolic carts. Uh, you can see this in the um, bottom left image, you know, just basic um, oxygen, CO2 consumption and uh, expir expiration, measuring how aerobically fit someone is. Musculoskeletal, uh, bod pod. Uh, DEXA machine and peripheral quantitative computer tomography. 
Uh, that would be on the top right image. It is basically giving us a 3D analysis of bone mass, muscle mass, fat mass, so on and so forth. So when we were talking about the research we were doing with the elderly or the old, don't call them elderly, older adults, we were calling them older athletes. Uh, we had them doing power cleans and kettlebell snatches. So we started calling them athletes. We did DEXA scans on them pre post training. So we were actually looking at uh, muscle mass changes, fat mass changes and possible bone density changes. Uh, so yeah, that's marketing the lab there. Um, again, common careers that our students are really uh, trying to get into PT, physical therapy and occupational therapy are most common. But the big shift I've started seeing the past couple of years is uh, doctorate of osteopathic medicine, DO. So they're trying to go to medical school, but specialize more in, in a DO side. So I'll say again, doctor, doctor of osteopathic medicine, more uh, fix the problem at its source instead of writing a prescription approach. And uh, our students, Students only have to take three extra classes to qualify to apply to medical school. Uh, all of our students take both the general chemistry courses and generally we have the minor in chemistry where they'll take two additional organic chemistries and a biochemistry class. So think three extra chemistry courses across four years of college and uh, you've met the prerequisites to apply to at least our United States based medical schools. Clinical exercise physiologist, cardiac rehabs, big strength and conditioning specialist. Uh, our uh, foot, uh, U.S. football strength and conditioning coach is a former graduate of ours. Um, again, athletic training has moved to a master's degree in our in, uh, in the United States, so kind of prepping there for there. And we haven't even had people working in a little bit in pharmaceutical sales. So our department's home. We're um, again, we have a beautiful building that was uh, constructed, I believe, in 2010. And we are the, actually the only academic unit within our building. So that allows us to work very closely with our sports teams. So you can see the images on the left side. At the top left, there's our weight room. Um, again, we have a lot of athletes that lift in there uh, primarily, but it is open to student body, student population. Uh, you're looking at anywhere from 16 power racks in there, uh, eight power lifting stations that you can see this guy's on. So when you're looking at a university of about 6,000 6, undergraduate students, there's plenty of space for everybody to be in there. Um, again, 22 varsity teams here. Uh, we also just recently went division one. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is, is uh, on this call about that, but we were originally a division three university sports qualification, and we have now moved to division one, which is one of the top tier sizes. Uh, we really expect that to draw more national attention from us. And we also started scholar. Um, that means also too, we can start providing full ride scholarships to our athletes uh, from across different sports. So we're expecting due to that move, we're expecting an even increased relationship between the, our college athletics and our department itself. You can see at the bottom, bottom left, we have a very competitive swim and dive team, a lane aquatic center. You can see the image second from the top. We have a gigantic indoor field house. Um, I don't know if you, Norway would probably be a good representation, but basically November to March, the weather's not too great outside up here. It can get a little chilly. So because of that, they have a great indoor training facility uh, that allows our uh, students and our student athletes to train and compete uh, during those cold winter months. Uh, cardio room, you can see a, um, at the, no, I don't have it listed, but if you notice the image, on the second from the bottom, you can see a, a baseball field and you can see the soccer track football field on the right side of that. And our building, if you're looking at the soccer and football field uh, is right there on the left side. So our building overlooks kind of the, the football and soccer stadium and track and so on and so forth. So it's in a, it's in a wonderful spot on campus. Okay. So the last thing I want to do here, and then I'll just open it up for questions, is I would like to uh, kind of share my screen and um, see here, and kind of showcase some equipment we have. Do we have any questions for me before I start to? Thomas, how, how's that go? Is there anything else? Yeah, you want to uh, show before I, get on? I, I didn't get any questions so far. I think, but I'll uh, let you know if anyone pops up. Thank you, Thomas. So Thomas, thumbs up. Can you see this? Can you see the uh, skeleton here? Yeah. All right, wonderful. So this was that motion capture device I was talking about uh, that's part of our uh, biomechanics lab equipment. Uh, we, this right here is a lower body model. I'm looking at the anterior side of the front side of this individual doing a squatting assessment. 
She um, has 24 markers on her and not to bore you, but they're on the right side on specific landmarks. She's got five on each feet. She's got four on the knees. She's got one on each femur and she has four on her hips. And then if you look here on the left side under channel, we actually have four electromyography devices on her as well. We have one on her vastus medialis, her vastus lateralis, so two on her quads, and then two on her hamstrings, specifically her semitendinosus and biceps femoris. And we're measuring how much her um, uh, legs are activating while she's doing the squat assessment. Um, again, I like to tell my students this is sexy, but it doesn't really tell us anything, right? So I'm gonna stop sharing that and I'm gonna share another one. We can take that data and we could plug it in to this. Uh, Thomas, can you see now a skeleton thumbs up? Can you see a skeleton frame? So I can plug it into this and this is that same gal using a different software doing a squatting analysis. And on the right side, you can see I'm looking at EMG on her glute, EMG on her vastus medialis. And then at the bottom, I'm getting her knee range of motion angle. So she's going through about 122 degrees of uh, knee flexion, knee extension here as she goes through her squatting analysis. Now, again, how can we use this? Well, in our research lines, if you're looking at sport performance base, you obviously want to maximize movement and be as efficiently as possible. Uh, but if you're looking at rehabilitation, this is something that we're starting to move into with our athletes here that are hurt is I can bring them into the lab. I can put them up on a box and I can have them jump off of the box, land on the force plate. I can measure the ground reactive forces that they're doing. I could also look at the angles that their hip, knee and a hip, knee and ankle are going through and how their muscles are firing with that electromyography. And if I have them do it on each leg, like a single leg on the right, a single leg on the left, I can then compare the two. And research is pretty clear with stuff like ACL reconstruction. You need to be within 90% symmetry on both sides before you can return to play. Uh, so we have the ability to more quantify that. And that's one thing that I talked about being, I'm very excited that with us going from division three to division one, uh, just continuing on to continue to work with these coaches, these athletic trainers and these team physicians that we have in our building. It's not like we have to go across the street. I just walked down the first floor, there they are. So, um, yeah. It's kind of the two big pieces of equipment I want to showcase. We have the motion capture, the force plates, and the electromyography. Okay, that's my pitch. Hopefully I, um, I answer, oh, I want to zoom the camera out and kind of show you just a lab space. It's going to be a little strange here. Give me a second. But um, again, prior to the COVID pandemic, we would have myself in here and about 12 other students. But you can see here, we got a pretty good size lab. So the station up here, you can actually see the cameras in the ceiling right there, right above me. You can see two right there. You can see our force plates. We have two force plates built down to the floor. There's a makeshift platform we built. Uh, and if I keep kind of screwing, moving over here on the other side of this fridge, we have a biochemistry blood analyzation area. So that freezer there is like negative 50 degrees Celsius. We have a guy that I like to call him a weirdo that only does blood research. And uh, that's what he does over there, more of the physiology side. And on the other side of the freezer as well, we have those metabolic carts. But you can see we kind of space the tables out, a big inverted to you. And uh, that allows us to get about six to eight students in here. So even uh, I know Thomas talked about it a little bit earlier, I've actually been teaching in person the entire uh, semester. And even though that we have had a lar pretty large amount of cases in the state that, that I live in, we haven't traced really any um, COVID transmission in our labs and our classes due to cleaning protocols, everyone being masked, everyone spacing out six feet apart. Um, so again, I agree with you, Thomas, it's probably more realistic that it's a fall 2021 back to normalcy date, but uh, we are still able to operate pretty well and officially in January and the spring um, with minimal, if any, transmission happening in our labs and in our classrooms. And then that's my piece and I'll turn it over to you, Thomas, and anybody that has questions. That's amazing. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for that, uh, Adam. Uh, really appreciate it. It was a, a really good presentation. I actually got one question, uh, and that was, uh, uh, can you explain more about the um, EMG? Yes, electromyography is this little device right here, this little Bluetooth device. I have okay. eight of these. Uh, I don't want to tilt my camera and throw everything off, but I have eight of these Bluetooth sensors that I can put on anywhere in the body that we want. Now, this is what we would call surface electromyography. 
There's no needles on it. If you go to occupational therapy school, you get in a car wreck and you can no longer grip a spoon or a fork. I need to figure out where the impulse for my central nervous system is no longer communicating with my hand. So we can put these devices on you and think of this. If you want to squeeze your palm, you have to send a message from your central nervous system all the way down and say muscle squeeze. That's a voltage. It's called depolarization coming all the way down the brain stem to your hand. The stronger the contraction, the higher the voltage is. And this device here can measure the voltage of a muscular contraction. So I'm going to go back here and share my screen one more time here. If you're looking at this squatting assessment here, this is what I mean to have. We have, a, we, ha we have it on actually a lot of her. If I, in this squatting assessment here, if you look on the left side, you can see normalized EMG percentage. I have EMG electrodes, these little devices on her biceps femoris, her gastrocnemius, her glute max, her vastus lateralis and medialis. And then look on the right side, you can see live feed. So notice the line moving from the left to right. The blue dots on these screens represents the bottom of her squat and the red, red dot is the top. And you can see how her muscle is changing the way it's firing between the different movement patterns. Now you might be asking, so what? Well, in the strength and conditioning field, that's very important to finding out which movements innervate and cause the most muscle activation. And if you look up in the rehabilitation field, uh, making sure that muscles are firing and recruiting the, same, the right way. So, you know, the most common injuries that we kind of, we see uh, are a lot of ACLs issue, knee problems. And what happens is when you go into crutches and a wheelchair for a couple months, all of those muscles across your hip and knee start to atrophy and they don't fire the right way anymore. So we can actually quantify how the muscles are firing. And then the cameras can pick up to see if you have any knee movement in the wrong direction, ankle immobility, so on and so forth. And then the force plates can tell us how much force you're absorbing. So think of if you're uh, rehabbing a knee, you're not likely to trust your ACL yet. You're going to land very stiff versus you land very flex and absorbent. So those force plates give us the ability to do that. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's amazing how, how science have, uh, have sort of changed how we uh, uh, think about uh, maximizing the human body's potential. I remember uh, I did um, some uh, sports classes for, for my uh, high school education and uh, my teacher told me that when uh, he was um, when he was young um, it, and, and it, this is serious they were they were told that the warm-up procedure especially if it was cold outside was to lean against the radiators before uh, before uh, a match so uh, Thankfully, we have come in a long way from that. And uh, I think also uh, probably in uh, our parents' time, I think also uh, for ski jumping, which is a big thing here. It might, I don't think you have many hills in, uh, around, uh, in and around Minnesota, do you guys? Not really. Uh, I mean, we're not the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, oh. but we have a little bit. Not like they do in Norway and Sweden, <laughs> Finland. I was actually in uh, in your area. I was cl I wasn't in uh, Norway. I was next door in Gothenburg, uh, Sweden. Okay. Cool. Uh, cool. Cool. Two years ago. So. Nice. Um, yeah, uh, Ethan, is there anything that I missed? That was uh, <clears throat> no. Thank uh, Thank you, Adam. That's yeah. Really great. I I learned a lot as well. <laughs> really useful. Um, I just wanted to add just a few things, and I'll be very brief. Um, kind of logistical things about uh, applying to St. Thomas. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to say, um, Minnesota, we have the largest population of Scandinavian Americans. So we have in the United States, so we have about 32% of our population here is has Scandinavian heritage, including myself. Uh, my fam my heritage is from Norway. Also, um, it's a big uh, giveaway. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, and then, so uh, any... Norwegian students who apply to St. Thomas with Sonor, um, we offer some pretty generous scholarships. Uh, as you know, attending private universities here in the US is not cheap, um, but we, we are giving on average approximately 60% discount on tuition to Norwegian students. And so that brings our cost into, you know, pretty close to what you're gonna be getting from Lona Kassen. Uh, I want to point that out. And then one more thing is if any Norwegian students who have completed the 13 year 
high school uh, 13 year education curriculum there. We do grant uh, sophomore standing. So in most cases, you would be able to graduate in three years rather than four years. So that's a big advantage for Norwegian students. And then we do not require any exams for Norwegian students. Uh, so you, you do not have to do SAT. And if you've scored four or higher on your English in your school, um, you do not need to do TOEFL or IELTS or any English proficiency testing. And if you have any questions, uh, if you're interested in applying, Thomas and the others over at Sonor are our trusted partners and I would encourage you to get in touch with them and they will help you out. Thanks for that, Ethan. Uh, it is much appreciated. Uh, yeah, so like Ethan said, if you're interested in uh, studying at the University of St. Thomas, contact uh, me or your, if you already had a designated uh, counselor in study at Norway, contact your counselor and we can help you out with your application. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not the faff, it's, uh, it's not the big procedure, it's rather easy actually. So uh, yeah, it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't take too much uh, effort. Uh, that being said, uh, thank you guys for the presentation. Now we're going to move on to uh, Mary in uh, University of Birmingham. Thank you, Thomas, um, and thank you, Adam and Ethan. That was really informative from my side as well. Um, so I'm not an expert in sport and I don't have that academic background, but I do know quite a bit about the department at Birmingham and what we have on offer. So I'm going to share my screen here. And hopefully my slides should come up for you. Okay. There we go. We've got thumbs up. We can see them. Lovely. And so my name's Mary and I'm here from the University of Birmingham, where I previously studied English. So I have a lot of understanding about the sports programme at Birmingham because I work in the recruitment and marketing team. So we have a lot of knowledge about the different departments at Birmingham and what we have on offer here today. So I'm going to get started by just letting you all know where Birmingham is, as you might be interested. So Birmingham's in right in the centre of the UK, so you can see it on the map there. We're about an hour and a half away from London, an hour and a half away from Manchester, so the main sort of centres within the UK and we're also the second biggest city in the UK so there's lots going on lots to do for young people. I'm going to go on to explain a little bit more about the city of Birmingham and what we have on offer but to start off I'm going to go into a bit more detail about the campus. So it is a campus university and uh, this is a picture of beautiful Birmingham here uh, so you can see it's got a lovely green space and green heart right at the centre of campus. All the main buildings are contained in one area. We've got the library on the right hand side of the screen that you can see there and the sort of central arc of our great hall as well on the centre of campus there just behind that clock there uh, and it's a nice open space for students to go in between when they're studying and a lovely um, open campus as well for you there. So that's a little bit of a brief introduction to our campus at Birmingham, but the majority of the talk I'm going to explain a little bit more about sport at Birmingham. So why you might want to be interested in studying at the University of Birmingham. So there are a couple of things to be aware of. Um, so we have our TEF gold rating. Uh, so that just means that within the UK, all universities are ranked in terms of their teaching and Birmingham has received that gold star rating. So the top level ranking for teaching that you could possibly get. So this just means that you're gonna be taught by the top researchers and professionals in the field. And I can speak from my experience that not only are they the top researchers and professionals, but they're able to communicate their ideas really clearly 
and really um, effectively and also just sort of approachable people that you can ask questions to if you are sort of struggling with any aspect of your degree so I think that's an important aspect of the studying experience as well. So we are a top 100 university you in the QS world rankings so there's lots of different rankings that you can look at to see which university is best and which university is best for your subject and um, QS is one of the biggest world rankings and we were 81st in the 2021 world rankings for that and um, so it's quite a high ranking that we're quite proud of at Birmingham and we also have really good links with the University of Birmingham sports department as well so that is a separate field in itself uh, that has sort of performance centres akin to um, the centres that we were hearing about earlier Adam was mentioning uh, and at Birmingham we've got our sports courses that I'm going to explain to you about and then we've got the sports department as well that's a little bit separate okay so the courses that we offer at Birmingham, as opposed to the list that Adam mentioned, the really long list of different courses that they have, at Birmingham we have a really selective programme of sports courses that you can take up. So we have two flagship sports programmes that are the ones I'm going to go into the majority of detail today and explain to you what might entail when you're studying those courses. So we've got the Sports, Exercise and Health Sciences programme at Birmingham and the Sports Physical Education and Coaching Sciences as well as two other programmes in Applied Golf Management and Physiotherapy as well. So they're just two other courses to be aware of. So the Physiotherapy course has um, a lot of placements as part of that and that really is just preparing you to become a physio and go into that line of work. The Applied Golf Management course is quite a unique programme to Birmingham within the UK as it's really having a close look at um, golf courses and it's also really well accredited it's got good links to um, the big golfing networks across the world and it's a really small program so there's only around 15 students year on year who take up that program but to go into more detail about the two Pro sports programs at Birmingham. I'm going to explain what different modules you might expect if you do decide to take up those courses at Birmingham. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about rankings already, so the fact that we're in the top 100, but not only that, we're also ranked the sixth best university in the world for sports related subjects from the QS World Rankings 2020. So that is something again we're really proud of and just emphasises the level of facilities that we have at Birmingham in terms of sport and the standard of teaching that you're going to expect if you choose to study sport at Birmingham. We've also recently been awarded the Athena Swan Silver Award, so that looks at equality and diversity and is specifically linked to our sports department. So um, we, you get your bronze award and we've recently moved up to silver from that, so that's something again we're proud of at Birmingham. So looking into a bit more detail about the sports exercise and health sciences program at Birmingham. Okay, so I've, this gives you a bit of a year by year uh, modules that you're going to expect from that program. Um, so I'm going to talk you through a couple of those and then give you some examples of things that you're going to be learning. Um, so you can see that um, becoming a researcher programme really looks at the research skills that you might want to gain from that course and prepares you for different um, skills that you're going to want to progress to as you go throughout your course at Birmingham and really makes you think in a different way as you move up to that higher level in education about what research means and how to effectively prepare and deliver your research as well. I'll also draw your attention to the science communication module as part of that course. That's a new module that's been created to prepare students 
perhaps life after university as it's really focusing on how to communicate and present their ideas around sports and it's providing you in this first year with the base level of skills and knowledge and understanding that you're going to need to deploy throughout your three years at Birmingham in this specific programme. You'll see as you move throughout your second and your third year, you'll develop those skills that you found in your first year module, become a researcher into that final year where you actually do deploy those skills in your own research project or civic engagement project where you can engage with the community and you would create your idea, your own project and dissertation around an area that you've particularly enjoyed throughout your first and second year, something completely different. It could be linked to the researchers that are going on in that department and that course and really employ that practical skills, that practical activity as part of that civic engagement project. There's also in your second year some placement opportunities that will again improve your employability skills and prepare you for the world of work after university and after Birmingham and um, so that's something again that could be a really good um, tool to your um, toolkit to prepare you for life after university. Okay so that is the sports exercise and health sciences program I'm then going to move on to talk the sports, physical education and coaching science programme. So you can see here that some of the modules do overlap. So that research project, those skills preparing you to become a researcher and develop your skills as a researcher are, are the same in your first, second and third year. However, if you look closely at the actual um, modules in yellow, you could see the content is different here. So where in your first year, you're looking at biochemistry, physiology, exercise and anatomy, in your second year, and first year you'd be looking more at teaching and coaching and introduction to sports science movement and learning so these might be construed as sort of softer skills less of a scientific base of the course here but it's more just developing around coaching and physical education in general and that's sort of the purpose of the course in general but you can see again you've got those overlapping you've got that science of communication module in your first year and you've also got that sports development those placement modules as well which again equip you for the world of work and life after the university of birmingham so to go into a bit more detail about your third year module options i've given you some examples here of modules that you might want to be picking from and just giving you a sense of those. So these modules are open to students in both the coaching science and the sports science um, degrees at Birmingham. So there's a whole host there. So I'm just going to talk you through a couple of those. Um, so you can look at contemporary issues in physical physical education, performing in extreme environments and how that has an effect on your physiology uh, and analysing that and looking at closer detail there. There's also a module available in clinical neuroscience and rehabilitation. So you can see the breadth of options out there just highlights the breadth of research that's going on at the University of Birmingham and the different modules are related to the different researchers that are taking place in our sports science department at Birmingham. So hopefully something on that screen there is provoking your interest and sparking an interest in the sports department at Birmingham as you can see the wealth of different experiences and opportunities out there from our sports courses at Birmingham. We also have a new uh, MSI program so that's a master's program built in to the sports exercise uh, and health sciences and coaching sciences courses as well so it incorporates an extra year so you would graduate with that master's degree problem program and you'll get 
more advanced research methods as part of that. So the skills that you've developed in your undergraduate degree, you're going to then develop further in your master's degree and delve deeper into the topics that you're interested in. Again, as part of your master's, you have more choice. So going back in your third year here, you can see you've got a lot of optional modules. Your master's takes that optional even further and you're really able to craft your master's into whichever way best suits you and around your interests as well. So it's that larger research project as part of that. You might also be interested in studying an international year as part of the sports courses at Birmingham. And this is a really great opportunity for you to extend your skills and develop your experiences while studying at the University of Birmingham. And so you can see the red dots on the map here show the different universities across the world where you can go and study and the universities that we are affiliated to and the links that we have. So across Europe, Australia, America, Canada, there's lots of different opportunities for you there. And that would be within your, um, it's an option after your second year. So you'd take the first two years as normal at Birmingham and then you'd go off in your third year to your international year and come back for your final year at Birmingham. So that's how that works. I get a lot of questions around careers and employability. So what might you be able to do after you graduate with a sporting degree from the University of Birmingham? And that's quite a hard question to answer, really, because the wealth of opportunity out there is so broad for you. And there's so many different opportunities available for you after you take up a sport degree at Birmingham. I've grouped these into a couple of key areas that you might be aware of. So you can go into sports sciences and coaching, so specific careers related to the content that you will be learning as that sports science degree. You can look further into health and wellness, so developing around um, health and looking at sport in relation to health and wellness is part of that. Or you could go into something completely different. So within the public and private sector, uh, there are a whole host of different careers that are open to you from studying a sports degree at Birmingham. So whether that's going into around law, you can go and do a conversion course from that sporting degree, uh, marketing, marketing related to sport, recruitment. It's skills that you have developed from your course that really can be transferred into a whole host of different careers after studying at Birmingham. And I've also included something around teaching as well. So if you're interested in education, you might want to do that. And one of my friends actually at Birmingham has gone on to become a primary school teacher after studying sports science at Birmingham. So that's always an option to you as well. Or you might want to learn more about the sport that you have studied in your undergraduate and your master's degree. So you might want to go on and study a PhD. So again, another of my friends who studied sports science at Birmingham has gone on to do a PhD in this area as they wanted to learn more and pursue more of an understanding of the subjects that they had started learning about at Birmingham. So there really are a whole host of options available to you. And I'll also draw your attention to the stat at the top, just underneath the title there. So you're looking at above 94%, 98% employability from the degrees at Birmingham. So what that means is that around 94% of students were employed or in further study up to six months after they graduated from Birmingham. So really, any student after Birmingham is so prepared for the world of work as that really, really high employability stat shows. Another aspect of studying at Birmingham and studying sport at Birmingham to be aware of is the support services available to you. So 
it could be a difficult transition at times going to study at university, especially if you're coming from a different country and from Norway there. So that's something to be aware of, that there's a whole host of different well-being and counselling services available to support you throughout your experience as a student. We've also got our Aston Web Student Hub, which is a new facility that's been built for all the sort of very simple administrative queries that you have around just being a student. So getting your ID card, you'd go to that um, student support hub. Um, any queries that you're having around visas, things like that, um, they're there to help and support you with that. And we've also got the Careers Network. So I worked for them whilst I was studying at Birmingham. So I'm quite uh, passionate about the work that they do there. And they do so much good things for students around getting employers onto campus. They do workshops for students, anything possible you can think of. The Careers Network put it on to try and improve your employability skills uh, and prepare you for the world of work as well. And uh, you've also got the Academic Skills Centre, so any sort of skills that you need to develop as part of your studies at Birmingham, the, you can get some tailored support within this centre and the student union worth mentioning. So that's a bit of a lighter level support. And um, so that's where the societies run at Birmingham. So any extracurriculars and they also have a mentoring service as well available for you then. So we're going to have a deeper look at the facilities at Birmingham now. So this is something again we're really proud of. Um, so the new sports centre is the flagship uh, sporting facility at Birmingham. So recently, uh, in 2018, this facility was built and developed and 55 million was put into the sports centre at Birmingham. And um, within that, we've got Birmingham's first 50 metre pool, so Olympic length pool, uh, a 200 station gym, you've got classes that happen as well at that, open to all students, not just sporting students as well at Birmingham. You've got the climbing wall and um, a high performance gym as well as part of that. So there's a whole host of different facilities at Birmingham to be aware of. And on top of that, we have over 55 different sports clubs that you can get involved with. So whatever your level of sporting ability, you can take part in a team and a society at Birmingham. So any different sport you can think of, we have at Birmingham uh, from various different um, hockey matches, hockey teams, squash, badminton, all sorts of different um, sports clubs that you can get involved with at Birmingham. Um, so just to tell you a little bit more about the city as well as we come closer to the end of the presentation, um, I thought it'd be nice to include this just to give you a little bit of context into where you might be studying. Uh, so what is Birmingham like as a city? So it is the second biggest city in the UK outside of London. Again, you, you've got to see that central location there. And I came to Birmingham from another part of the UK, um, so up north near Leeds, and I didn't really know much about the city before I came to study here, but I was really surprised by the how much goes on within the city centre and how much I've actually kind of fallen in love with the city really uh, and a lot of graduates have that similar experience as well so I think it's 48% of graduates choose to stay in Birmingham after they've studied there so you have that really nice campus environment being at the university but you have a great city on your doorstep as well so it's really easy it's seven minutes on the train from the university campus into the city centre and it's really really cheap for you to get a train ticket we've got that train station on campus so it's really good transport links and from that if it's another 10 minutes so you've got 10 minutes from the campus to the from the campus to the city and then from the city to the international airport another 10 minutes so it's really easy for you to get to Birmingham and then to the international airport and then to Norway and um, as I did um, a couple of um, nearly a year ago now actually and um, so yeah it's really easy for you to fly from Birmingham to Norway. It's also really multi multicultural city, really diverse, we've got a whole 
um, over 10,000 international students at Birmingham now. Uh, so uh, lots of different um, students from a very diverse level of different countries coming to study at Birmingham. And just another thing to be aware of within the city, you've got um, arts venues, shopping places, Michelin star restaurants, so top places to eat as well. So really, whatever your interests and whatever you like to do in your spare time, you can pursue in Birmingham, the city centre. Another thing I thought was really nice and important to include, um, the Commonwealth Games that's coming onto campus in 2022. Uh, so if you choose to study at Birmingham, this will be part of your student experience at Birmingham. And we've also got the hockey and squash competitions that will actually be happening on campus. And the university will be hosting the main um, village, the athletes where they come and stay, will be staying in university accommodation as well. Uh, so that's really exciting at Birmingham and I'm really excited for that. It's a great opportunity for sporting students to get involved in that. There'll be opportunities to volunteer and just to get caught up in that sort of Olympic Games like atmosphere as part of the Commonwealth Games, which obviously it's a smaller event, uh, but it is an international event nonetheless. So um, I'm not sure if we've had any questions come through. I can't say any on the chat, but if you do have uh, any questions so far, uh, about Birmingham or about school. No questions so far. No questions no. so far. So, but uh, thank you for the <laughs> presentation. We can give, uh, give mm -hmm. the crowd a few more minutes, maybe. Uh, maybe they'll think of something. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just briefly summarize the different uh, career uh, options that are, are available for students who uh, pursue either sp uh, sports science uh, based uh, programs, uh, nut nutrition di dietics based uh, programs, or uh, coaching or public health programs. So um, the uh, uh, I would say actually the majority of uh, people who take a degree within uh, sports science and coaching, they end up teaching in Norway. Uh, so and it's, it's a relatively easy process to become a trained teacher after you've done a master's degree abroad um, and you are required to do a master's degree in order to be, be admitted to the teacher training programs. And uh, it is a one year program that is very uh, very based towards actually practic practical experience of going into schools and getting feedback on uh, uh, the, the lessons and the classes you have for real children out in the real world. So it's a really, really good way of um, becoming a teacher. There is also, of course, the option that was mentioned earlier of doing further education, doing PhDs, uh, teaching at uh, uh, polytechnical universities or, uh, or uh, in, in, in higher education in general, or doing even further research either in re re with relations to uh, a research, research institute or at uh, university itself. Uh, and also a lot of people that I know personally who did uh, sports science, they have a part-time part -time job teaching and then they also do a semi-professional uh, coaching job within football, handball, ice hockey, or whatever the, the sport they specialize in. So that's also, of course, a, a career uh, option for, for people who are more into the sports science and coaching part of this um, field of study. Uh, you also get some uh, personal trainers, probably a bit overqualified for that, to be honest, uh, but a lot of people do it because they enjoy uh, helping people out. There is also, uh, uh, as Adam mentioned, uh, physiotherapy that you can do, uh, though you're not necessarily allowed to call yourself a physiotherapist, but you can you can still help people out with the, any problems that they will have in any day life. There is also, if you move and look more towards the public health sector, there are uh, plenty of jobs within uh, public administration, but also within uh, private consultancy that help, that usually help uh, are helping out uh, public institutions with uh, uh, giving them great training programs for the people who are using their services and stuff like that. 
uh, also of course within uh, with the within the nutrition part of uh, this field of study uh, there is also I would say the an important difference that you need to know about. Uh, so if you want to become a clinic, so working with nutrition clinically, uh, you it's usually uh, a bit more than a bachelor's degree. Uh, and also that is something you have to apply for to get uh, certified in uh, Norway. Uh, and that you do, uh, you get the certification from uh, Helsedirektoratet. Uh, but you you don't have to do all the clinical training to work with people and uh, give them advice about what they should eat, not to eat, uh, uh, and uh, and tailor uh, nutrition plans for people. Uh, you're not allowed to call yourself a clinical nutrition specialist, but you can still give uh, people advice about uh, what they should eat and not eat and also uh, I also put in uh, kind of last minute also uh, you can become a health influencer uh, I don't know if any of you who are watching this are interested in that but that's also an option uh, and you uh, um, I follow some of these people on Instagram and Facebook and I have to say that uh, the people who actually have a few credits from university they give much better advice than people who are sort of self-thought uh, in this area. So that's also something to keep in mind. Uh, and uh, actually, I think I got the question. So um, just give me one second to get the chat up. Uh, so is the uh, this would be a question to you actually, Mary. Uh, so is um, uh, the what would be the English translation? The uh, chiropractic uh, first year is uh, if you do that, it, it is easy to transfer into a physiotherapy degree in England. Uh, so we don't have a chiropractic degree at Birmingham. But if someone did, for example, chiropractic uh, in, in another university, could they mm -hmm. transfer into, for example, the, uh, get some credits transferred to the a physiotherapy degree at the University of Birmingham? Mm -hmm. um, so it might be a little bit difficult, actually, um, to transfer your credits across. So if you met the entry requirements for the course, um, that you could definitely go on and study your first year and go on, and that would be fine to study physiotherapy. Um, but in actually transferring credits, because the course is quite um, vocational and there's specific key modules that you need to um, have under your belt for that course, in terms of actually transferring that course, I don't think that would be possible. Um, but if you fulfill the entry requirements starting from your first year, that would be absolutely fine. Okay, yeah, thanks Thanks for that answer. Uh, another question as well, which uh, kind of relates to what you touched upon earlier. So uh, what is the main difference between uh, doing a um, sports science degree and doing a, a more coaching based degree? And I think you put it quite uh, simply as uh, 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 the coaching degree is more the softer skills and also a bit more uh, the human side of sports, whereas the sports science mm -hmm. part of doing uh, of studying is a bit more natural science related in a way. It's a bit more uh, scientific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it, Thomas. I couldn't put yeah. it much better myself. Uh, and just in terms of the actual content of the degrees, obviously there's some overlap. So you had that science communication module in your first year, that's on both courses. Your research project, that's a part of both courses. But in terms of the other modules, the sports science, you've got your biochemistry, human physiology and functional anatomy in your first year compared to an introduction to teaching and coaching, introduction to sports science, movement and learning. And also just on a basic level, the entry requirements are um, slightly different. And um, so you need, don't need as higher grades for the um, sports coaching science 
side of the course as you do for the um, sports science co side of it. So the health sciences, sport and exercise health sciences, that is high, higher entry requirements. Thanks for that. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions actually. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think we're going to end this webinar there. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, logging on and for uh, joining us this evening. And thank you to Mary, to Ethan and to Adam for uh, uh, presenting. And I wish you all a really good evening and remember to get in touch with uh, me or any of the other people who have been talking today. Uh, do you have anything more to add, Ethan, before we leave? No, oh, thank you very much. I'm happy to join. Great stuff. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, please uh, get in contact with Study Arts in Norway, uh, with the University of St. Thomas or University of Birmingham if you have any qu further questions about uh, studying uh, sports science and nutrition or coaching or any other subjects and we are happy to help you guys out so yeah best of luck with your applications and hopefully we'll uh, speak to you guys uh, in person soon so take care bye thanks thomas thank you all for coming bye